Let's begin reading and uh, let's, let's kick it up like Cody did back to verse 11. In him, in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. How? By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Notice 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you... Colossians, you Colossians, you Christians, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, Jesus God, the Holy Spirit, he has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements or ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having, incidentally, in verse 15, disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are simply a shadow of things to come. The substance is of Christ. Wow. That's a, that's a mouthful. That's saying a lot today. And then what I want to do here in the first segment of my message is talk about what Christ has done for us. What has he done for us? So far in the book of Colossians, what have we seen? Well, number one, that he sustains us. Well, what does that mean? Well, Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things and in him by all things consist. I want to tell you what that means. That means he holds it all together. You ever feel like you're falling apart? I mean, sometimes we do. With the things that happen to us in this life, sometimes we feel like, hey, I'm just falling apart. I'm just falling apart. God reminds me of the story of the woman who got into some water and she got in deeper than she thought she was in. And somebody had to jump in there and, and save her because she thought she was drowning. And the guy reached over there to her and pulled, and he, and he reached her hair, and she had a wig, and her wig came off. And so he couldn't, he couldn't grab her by her head. He grabbed over to her arm, and she had a prosthetic. Her arm came off. He couldn't grab her by the arm. He reached over there to her ankle, and her shoe came off. He finally got her up, and when he got her up, she said, thank you, thank you for saving me. And he said, saving you? He said, you fell apart so many times, I didn't know if I was going to get you out of there or not. So many times we feel like we're falling apart. He sustains us. In Colossians 2 verse 9, we learn that he, the whole Godhead dwells in us in a bodily form. He dwells in us. He guides us. I, I like Colossians 2 verse 6. It says, as you therefore have received Christ, so walk in him. We need direction. We need guidance. He guides us. Number four, he, he, he grounds us. We are grounded and, and, and built up, he says, in the faith in Colossians 2 and verse 7. We are grounded by Jesus. Colossians 2, 9 also says that he fills us. You want to be full today? I don't just mean at between 11.30 and 1.00. I mean, something that'll stay with you the rest of the day, the rest of the night, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year, the rest of your life. He fills us up. As we hunger and thirst for righteousness in Matthew 5 and verse 6, it is Jesus who, who fills us. And incidentally, in 2.13, he's the one who removes the filth of the flesh. When, when we make mistakes and we trespass and we go against God and we do things we shouldn't do, through that cleansing of that watery grave of baptism that we read in Colossians 2 and verse 12, he removes the filth of the flesh. And then what, what does he do? He, he renews us. We're renewed in, the, in, that, in that faith of the working of God in Colossians 2 and verse 12. So as we take a cursory look at just some things we've already looked at in the book of Colossians, we need to understand what Christ 
does for us on a continuous basis. And this morning, that's at work in our lives even as we speak. Finally, I like this last one. He conquers. He is triumphing in it for us. There are a lot of things that we have trouble trying to conquer, but he conquers it for us. So these are all the things that he does for us. But let's look a little bit more at some things that are found in our text. Five things in Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 17 or 18. Number one, we're, we're complete in him. Do you know what that means? Do, do you see the ramifications of, of always in our culture and day and time, always looking at that mirror and seeing those flaws? Always looking in that mirror and saying, I'm just not physically the way that I want to be. We don't have to worry about that with Jesus because he completes our life. And as we hold fast to him, and that's going to be the sum and substance of the one o'clock message, that, that we hold fast to the head. He, he helps us to understand the concept of being alive in him. You know, it was the Ephesian letter, if you remember in chapter 2, in verse 1 and in verse 5, he says, and you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Do you, you know, most of the people that you work with are actually dead. Do you know, most of the people you go to school with are actually dead. Do you know, most of the people that you see in the department stores, most of the people that you see in vehicles, are actually dead. Doesn't that sound strange? People are dead to their trespasses and their sins. And, and, and the Colossian epistle and the Colossian letter was written to say we are alive in him. That's what Colossians 2 and verse 12 says. And, and the song that, that we were singing there, that, that number 85, if you've looked at the chorus lately of that song, dead to the world to the voices that call me, the people that want you to cuss, the people that want you to lie, the people that want you to cheat, the people that want you to deceive. We're, we're, we're dead to the voices that call us. Living a new, obedient, but free. D dead to those joys, those temporary joys that, that, that we once thought would enthrall us. He says, yet tis not I, but Christ liveth in me. So I, I die with him. In this place behind me is what's referred to as a baptistry. Children are always fascinated with baptistries. They always want to peer over there. They always want to look in. That, that's one of the reasons why from, from time to time when we have a public baptism that I, I like for the children to come on up here and, and see that it's not mysterious, but it's something that someday we expect you to do and we hope that you will do and we anticipate that you will do, that, that you too will, will die with him in that watery grave of baptism. And as you die in him, the one before it, you, you become alive in him. But after you die with him, that you would seek him. And that'll be, you know, next Sunday's message from Colossians chapter 3. But, but these five things just stand out in our text. Now, having given us what Christ does for us and the five things that are in our text, what I want to do with the rest of our message is, is really talk about these five things. And then we'll make some application with the next slide. As we are alive in him, it's because that he has forgiven us. Did you read Colossians 2, 14, 13 and 14? That, that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, but because of our burial and baptism, we experience now forgiveness. And there is a sense in which some blotting out is occurring. You remember the day before computers? Now they... The young people in the room, they don't remember those days. <laughs> but there was, there was a day when there was something called a typewriter. Some of you younger folks Google that when you get home. 
a typewriter. What, it, and you, what, what you used to be able to do is you used to be able to get this stuff called whiteout. <laughs> and when you make a mistake, you, what you would do, you would blot it out. You'd blot, that's what you, you'd blot it out. That's what you would do. The whiteout would blot out, and you would just go back and retype over that or whatever the situation was, and it was just like it had never occurred. It never happened. Did you know that's what happens when we're baptized? God takes that great big white out and in blood, you heard what Paul said this morning, didn't you? In blood, he says, blot it out, just as if it never existed. That's one of the beauties of this text. And then it says, here's the price that was paid for that. See, the wrist is part of the hand. And the feet that were nailed to the cross. He said they were nailed there because that was part of crucifixion. And crucifixion being this ancient instrument of torture and execution, the person wasn't going to get out off that cross. They were going to stay on that cross. And so Jesus was nailed to that cross. And then number four, he disarmed the enemy. Now, we're never, we're never, never, I don't care what president, I don't care what house, what senate, in America, we're always going to have enemies. Always. We're never going to get rid of the enemy. It doesn't happen. It won't happen. There's always going to be some entity, some evil, some monster that's going to raise its ugly head in opposition to this country because we experience freedom here. Because we have the free enterprise system here. Because people have the opportunity and the choice because of their occupation and vocation to provide for their families and make a good living in the United States of America. There are people that do not like our system. And so we're always going to have enemies. Did you know that Jesus, when he was nailed to the cross, disarmed the enemy? You know what I'm saying about that? Satan has no power over you but what you choose to let him have in your life. Amen? See, there's the truth of that matter. If you feel like you're fighting a losing battle, you haven't disarmed the enemy. You haven't been baptized. You haven't reached the blood of Jesus. You haven't become disarmed because he'll disarm the enemy. Does that mean the enemy's not real? No, I didn't say that. But I said you'll have access to overcome the enemy. And that will lead to being triumphed. That will lead to victory. When was the last time you read the book of Revelation? You know what it says? The good guys win. The bad guys are defeated. Now, I know sometimes it looks like the bad guys are winning. I mean, it really does. So many times out here in the world, we sing that song farther along. We don't understand why it seems like the wicked prosper. They do short term. Believe me. They are going to prosper short term, but long term, they're going to go down. Like the Titanic, they're going to go down. And so I've said all of that to say this this morning. And here's what I want you to get in today's message. How are we made alive? And here's the process. Number one, through forgiveness. Take your Bibles and trek back with us. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, I want you to see verses 8 through 12 of Psalm 103. I think sometimes we lose sight of, of the forgiveness of God. Listen to these words. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Now watch 11 and 12. Here's the clincher. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Now watch this, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is that? How far is that? 
I would suggest to us that there is an, e there is an eastern side to Warren County. There is a western side to Warren County. We usually talk about it being north and south, but there's an east and a west. There's an eastern Kentucky. Did you know that there's an eastern Kentucky? Did you know it's like a whole different world? I mean, I'm being honest about it. It really is. It's a different culture in eastern Kentucky versus western Kentucky. That's just the way it is. And do you know how different the worlds are on the east coast than they are on the west coast? And why don't you get on a plane and go to the west coast and try to almost meet yourself? What he's saying is, look how far God has removed our sins from our lives when we're baptized. When we are forgiven. When we experience forgiveness. And number two, we experience emancipation. It, it's not just the fact that we experience new life. That's not just it. It's not just the fact that, hey, I'm a Christian, I get new life. That's not just it. It's a better life. I've never met anybody that hasn't told me that now I'm living a better life since I became a Christian than I did before. Not just new. Oh, yeah, there's newness of life. But it's a better life. See, John 10, verse 10 says this, The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. Watch this. But I am come that they might have life, better life, and have it more abundantly. So again, it's not, it's not just emancipation. And it's not just a new life. It is a better life. And number three, it's one where we can really experience victory and triumph. When Paul wrote his personal letter to the church at Corinth, it's in 2 Corinthians. He said a lot of good things to these people. Look what he said in 2.14. Let me read it to you. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Did you see how the victory comes? We're always led in triumph, but it's always through Christ. He's the mechanism. He's the vehicle. He's the power source. It's through him that we experience victory. And number four, and this one I want to spend just a couple minutes on and then, then we're going to be done. In Colossians chapter 2, we'll finish this up this afternoon, but in Colossians chapter 2, nine times, nine times in one chapter, It talks about being with him. It talks about being in him. It talks about being in whom. You know what the connection is? Jesus. Jesus is the connection. You got here today because you have a battery in your car, your truck, your vehicle, whatever you drove here. I didn't see anybody in a horse and buggy. <laughs> You have a battery. If it's not connected, you're not going anywhere. It don't matter how nice your ride is or how old it is or how new it is. If the connection is not there, you're not going anywhere. And if the same is true with heaven. If you're not connected to Jesus, you're not going to make it. Now, one person said amen. I'm going to say it again. If you're not connected to Jesus, you're not going to make it. Alive in him. You can experience that this morning. By repenting, changing your life, confessing the sweet name of Jesus, and by saying, where's the water? I want to reach the blood of Jesus. I want to connect. And I want to stay connected. It may be that you become disconnected. And you need to reconnect. 